Hello everyone and welcome to our Unfiltered Career Insights webinar. Our panel is excited to share their career development experience so far at Fair and Peers. Um, before we go ahead and get started, I just wanted to cover a couple of housekeeping items. If you happen to have a question during the webinar, please feel free to write it in the questions tab within the GoToWebinar Go panel, and we will do our best to provide answers to the questions asked during the webinar. But if we happen to run out of time, just know that we'll follow up with each of you individually afterwards. Um, finally, if you have any questions that come up after listening in on the webinar, please feel free to send them our way by emailing careers at fairandpeers.com. We'll have that email up on uh, the final slide at the end of the webinar. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the host of today's webinar, Matt Henry. Thanks, Amanda, and uh, welcome to everybody who's joining us for the webinar today. Um, I'm Matt Henry, and uh, this is the, I think, the third or the fourth uh, webinar that we've done, fourth, that uh, that we've done on, that we call Unfiltered Career Insights. And it's been uh, very well received in the last couple of years, and we decided to do it again this year. And uh, as you could tell from the from the introductory materials that we sent out, this one is focused. Uh, try to focus this a little bit on early opportunities to get involved and all the things that are going on here at at Fair and Peers. So we've got a uh, a distinguished panel here that you can see up on the screen. And uh, we will uh, what we're going to do is go through and ask them each of them to briefly introduce themselves, give you a little bit of background beyond their what you read on the bio for them. And then we will jump right into the Q&A and both the chat and we've got some questions that came in early. Thanks to those of you who, who provided those uh, before the webinar. So uh, let's, let's get started. And let's, uh, Jesse, we're going to start with you. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Hello, my name is Jesse Cohn and I work in the DC office. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in visual arts and urban studies from Brown University. And while art and urban studies may seem pretty unrelated, I tie them together through my interest in how people interact with the space around them. Um, after school, I spent a few years volunteering through AmeriCorps, doing Hurricane Katrina relief, um, interning with advocacy organizations like the Rails to Trails Conservancy and the Washington Area Bicyclist Association and working in the public sector at the U.S. Department of Transportation Volpe Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and through those experiences, I, I focused my interest in transportation and decided to apply, apply to planning school. So I got my master's degree in city and regional planning from UNC Chapel Hill. Go Heels, um, Go where, Heels. I Go Heels. <laughs> um, where I focused on transportation um, and my graduate thesis there was developing and pilot testing um, a survey tool related to trail use and physical activity. I joined Fair and Peers um, once I finished my graduate degree in um, July 2015. So I started in the San Francisco office that summer. I worked in San Francisco for about 18 months before moving to the DC office. And so now I've been in DC since about January 2017. Um, so I had been interested in moving back to the East Coast. This is where I'm from. And, and I felt fortunate that I had the flexibility to do that while still working at Fair and Peers. Um, so while I was in graduate school, I'd been interested and involved in some work around diversity and inclusion and equity. And so once at Fair and Peers, I was curious to see how these concepts were integrated into the work that we were already doing here and if there were opportunities to do more work related to equity. So I started having conversations with senior staff and leaders around the company to answer this question. And my conversations likely paired with kind of a growing national conversation about income inequality and social justice led Fair and Peers to develop a technical initiative with some dedicated funding to look more into equity. So you may be familiar if you've read on our website that Fair and Peers invests some of its profits back into research and now equity um, is a small piece of that research pie. And so I've been able to use that budget to understand the state of the practice, thinking about both community engagement and more quantitative approaches to equity. And I've had opportunities to participate in several conferences, including TRB and the ITE annual meeting to share some of what we've learned so far in this area. Um, so that's just a little bit about the work I've done and I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Appreciate that. Let's go to Sarah in Seattle. Hi, so I'm Sarah Sabiscus, and I'm based out of the Seattle office. Um, to tell you a little bit about how I got into transportation and urban planning, um, I went to Skidmore College in upstate New York for undergrad, um, where I studied international relations and anthropology. 
Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do professionally after graduation, so um, after a short stint in online advertising in Chicago, I decided to give environmental consulting a try. Um, I worked for a small firm here in Seattle for about four years that offers services in public outreach and facilitation on controversial environmental issues like salmon recovery and climate change. Um, my firm facilitated a stakeholder group on climate change for the city of Seattle, um, and I came to realize how big of an impact transportation plays in climate change. Um, there were a few bike ped advocates at the table, and I remember hearing about what they did and thinking, man, I want to do what they do, um, working to make the city more walkable and bikeable. Um, that led me to get my master's in city planning from Berkeley, where I concentrated um, my studies in both transportation planning and urban design. Um, and during school, I also did an internship with Tool Design Group in DC. So I've been with Farron Peers in Seattle now for a little over two years. I started as a transportation planner, um, and after serving as project manager on several projects, um, got promoted to senior transportation planner this summer. Um, while I was in school, I had always thought of Farron Peers as a transportation engineering firm, so I'd honestly um, initially ruled it out during my job search, um, but came to learn about all the cool planning work that the firm is doing. Um, I love the variety of project types I get to work on, everything from transportation master plans, active transportation plans and transit plans, um, to downtown visioning projects where I work with urban design and architecture firms on reimagining sub areas within cities. Um, I've had a lot of opportunities to get involved within the company and grow professionally. Um, I've attended you know, in-person trainings in California, as well as dozens of online webinars. Um, I participate in monthly meetings of the Bike Ped Discipline Group um, and have attended conferences. Um, but one opportunity I wanted to highlight um, was that this year I've been working with Carrie Modi out of our Oakland office. Um, she's been serving as my early career mentor. Um, we've had monthly check-in calls and she's helped me a lot as I've transitioned into managing more and more projects. Um, but I found out this summer that she was going on maternity leave in the fall. Um, so I had the opportunity to take over a really cool, high-profile project that she was managing, um, the Active Transportation Plan for Pittsburgh, California. Um, it's been a huge growing opportunity for me, um, and one of the company's principals is coaching me through the process. So I um, thought I'd highlight that, and thanks for having me here today. Thanks, Sarah. That's great. Uh, all right, Alan, you're up. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alan Wayne, and uh, I'm a senior engineer in the San Jose office here in the Bay Area. Uh, just some quick background about myself. I studied civil engineering uh, in my undergrad with a concentration actually in structural engineering back at University of Washington. Uh, and then through my senior year there, I started to kind of realize that structural engineering was probably not the right fit for me as I spent a lot of time kind of just, you know, calculating load and applying equations in the various manuals that you may be familiar with. And then there were just very little things for me to kind of visualize and relate to personally. So after graduating uh, in 2012, I decided to kind of go to grad school and take a different approach. Uh, so I went into UC Berkeley into their transportation program for one year. And then from there, I kind of got a lot more in, uh, into transportation and learned a lot of, uh, about the basics. So after I, I graduated in 2013, I joined uh, the Roosevelt office uh, at Ferry Piers uh, and then uh, spent about two years there until 2015. And then I moved down to the San Jose office in 2015 for some personal reasons. My um, my family actually got moved to, to the Bay Area, so I wanted to kind of stay closer with them. And then over the last couple of years, I've worked on a broad range of projects, you know, from traffic impact studies to transit planning projects, TDM plans, parking studies, and some interchange work as well. So I've, through these projects, I've actually developed some expertise in micro simulation modeling and travel demand forecasting. And my current role in the in the office and in the company includes some uh, includes you know management of projects and training training uh, junior staff on technical skills and then also supporting some senior level staff on some technical work. Uh, I'm also involved uh, in the discipline in the multimodal operations and travel demand forecasting discipline group, and and I've tried to kind of at least lead uh, one or two uh, project research projects or action item uh, on that in in the within that discipline group every year. So for example, last year I uh, or actually in 2016 I worked with other folks in the group to uh, work on the AV simulation research on freeways. So that was uh, that was submitted to TRB. That was a very interesting experience. It was funded fully by by the company. And then over the last three years, I want to say, I've 
been working very closely with some of the big tech companies here in the Bay Area, helping them kind of identify strategies to improve their employee commute and also working with them on some of the day to day issues that they face on their uh, on their campuses and also helping them through some of the entitlement process with public agencies. Uh, one example I'd like to kind of share a little bit with you in terms of my early career opportunity and involvement was that when I first moved down to San Jose in 2015, that was a little after uh, a little two years after I started with the company. Uh, one of the tech companies reached out to us and wanted us to kind of provide on-site staff support one day a week, meaning that they basically want someone from Fair and Peers work with them, you know, one day every week and spend just spend the time there. So even though I was kind of relatively new to the area and not quite familiar with their work style, I kind of took the responsibility to re represent Fair and Peers, knowing that it was actually a great opportunity to, to enhance our presence on site and also develop that working relationship with them. So I've been doing that for almost three years now and have become you know, one of their trusted advisors on transportation related issues. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of share that experience and uh, I'd love to kind of share more with you on the Q&A session. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Alan, appreciate that. Um, so yeah, we're gonna jump in with, with questions now. We, like I said, we received several ahead of time. And by the way, uh, in terms of those who were signed up, just to give everybody a flavor who's on the call here, we have, I think we have the four corners of the country covered here. We have, we have a group from UW, which I think is, We've got, uh, is it, is it, Sarah, did you say Ariel and Daniel are there with the? Daniel and Carmen. Or Carmen, Carmen are there with the group from UW, uh, fresh off their win on the Apple Cup, by the way, which is a big win over Washington State. We have, we have Cornell over by where, near where you were, Sarah, at Skidmore, up in the upstate area in New York. We have FAU, Florida Atlantic, down in the southeast, and then we have uh, USC, UCLA, we have uh, UCI down in the southeast, and of course we've got a couple of universities from, from DC area as well. So anyway, lots of lots of good geographic coverage around. So let's, we're going to start with this first question uh, that came in earlier. Uh, what are the most essential skills a future planning graduate should possess for an effective start in transportation? So Jesse, you and Sarah both are are uh, are planning graduate uh, graduates. So maybe. Which, which of you would like to take this one? Jesse, you want to start? Sure, yeah, I can ahead, start Jesse, let you build on what I, what I say. So um, one of the most essential skills I think is critical thinking. And so being able to think through complex problems is really important, but also being able to assess if your results or analysis make sense. Um, so if say you've done some sort of analysis and the results aren't as, as expected, I think a really important skill is being able to figure out why that is. Um, did you make assumptions that maybe weren't accurate? Um, was there some reason why the data was incorrect? Or is there maybe some underlying reason why the results just defy expectations? So I think it's important for you to be able to, to pull out the key story from the work that you're doing. Um, and especially as we're starting to work with more big data and larger robust data sets, being able to take what you're finding in numbers and translate it into key findings and key takeaways is really important. Um, and from a more hard skills perspective, I'd say that you can't go wrong with knowing your Excel. So, um, and make sure you're confident with different formulas, especially thinking through if statements um, and like some if, count if, and things like that. Cause I think we work in Excel a lot here at Fair and Peers. And just to build on that a little bit, I think being a strong writer is key. Um, I had one professor that stressed that concise writing is the best writing. So being able to articulate your points clearly and concisely is key in the work that we do. Um, and also being able to distill really complex topics into lay terms for public audience. We do a lot of work with um, public outreach and going out to the community. And so, and a lot of what we do is really technical. So being able to distill that into um, understandable terms. Um, and I think also just being extremely organized. Um, if people haven't worked in consulting before, it can be hard to juggle multiple projects and commitments. Um, so that's something that I think is really useful too. And then kind of building on what Jesse said with Excel, a lot of the technical softwares can be learned on the job, um, but I found it really helpful to know some GIS coming into the work here. Yeah, I was gonna mention GIS, Sarah. I don't know if you or Jesse had that skill coming in, but it seems like a lot of the uh, planning grads come in with that kind of gives us a sense that they have some analytical skill that the, because 
lot of the work we do is planning oriented, but it, there's an there's an analytical element to the to the vast majority of what we do. So I think it's I appreciate the fact that you you've emphasized emphasized that. Uh, so let's move on then to the next question, uh, Alan. I'm going to turn this one to you. Uh, what are the typical tasks for an entry level engineer or planner? And 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 then there's sort of the second question is what does it take to move up? But why don't you well, let's start with the the typical tasks. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, I'd say in terms of entry level planner or engineers, I'd say they're often brought on to a broad range of projects in the first year or so, you know, depending on where, where the needs are in, in the office. Uh, but if I have to kind of say the specific task, I want to say Excel is definitely one of the common uh, tasks that we kind of, you know, work with the en entry level engineers and planners on. Uh, varying, you know, it could vary from data processing or review traffic counts, parking data that we got from a vendor, or performing some sort of a technical calculation that was already developed or set up in a workbook. Or it could be a case that we need someone to kind of come in and create their own work, you know, spreadsheet to kind of set up a workflow to answer to answer a, a question from, you know, to to the client. And other tasks, other tasks could involve in, you know. Uh, parking studies, uh, traffic analysis, traffic impact analysis, where you might be plugged into, you know, running some synchronous analysis, generate level service reports and level service results. And that, you know, all, all kinds of studies could involve a combination of technical uh, na analysis with, uh, with writing in there. Because uh, a lot of times with the deliverable for a project could be, a, you know, a technical memorandum or a more formal report, but those could be more common tasks for entry level staff members. Great, great. And then uh, the, the supplement to that uh, was, what does it take to move up? Sarah, what do you, what do you, what would you say to that one? I'd say one of the best pieces of advice I received early on in my career was to anticipate, work to anticipate the needs of your project manager, and you know, trying to offer help on tasks before they might even ask you to complete something. And that's definitely something that's helped me move up in my career. Good. Good. Yeah, Jesse, anything to add on that one? Yeah, another piece of advice that I would add, um, similarly that I was given early in my career, is to ask questions. So this is a firm of nearly 300 people. So when I was a new hire and occasionally struggling to answer a problem, it's likely that someone else in the firm has already addressed this issue before or addressed something similar. So I think just knowing how to use your resources, um, and Fair Peers has a breadth of technical resources to just learn um, learn how to address things rather than rather than spinning my wheels when I don't know the answer. Did, did you have any any uh, I wouldn't say fears, but maybe hesitation about is it okay just to pick up the phone and call somebody? And and if so, how did you get past that? Yeah, I think it's important um, to be humble about what you know. And I think you know, Fair and Peers is a very collaborative environment, and so staff are always willing to kind of share what they've what they uh what they've learned and so i think you know once you've been hired you're already in the door and you know fair like you've been hired because people are confident that you have the skills and experience to excel here so there's not a need to kind of act like you know everything i think there's a lot of value in acknowledging the things that you don't know and what you can learn from your peers and superiors thanks so i got one more and i'm actually i would like this one for all three of you to weigh in on this one because it's pretty central to our our theme here today and then we'll go to the there's a couple in the chat box i want to get to after this one so uh alan let's start with you how did you what what's sort of the way we talked a lot about you've all given great examples of how you got involved early in your time here at fair and pierce so how did you do it essentially what 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 were the keys to 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 getting involved early so we'll start with you alan and then we'll go to sarah and then jesse yeah, I want to say that uh, when I first came in, I definitely wanted to make sure that I kept an open and inquiring mindset, I went, especially when brought on to new projects or working with you know new staff members or PMs in the office, because uh, there's always a good variety of projects going on at any given time in the company. So there's always something you can learn from me on each project. So coming in with that mindset really kind of helped me set up that relationship and opened me up to a lot of new opportunities. 
And, you know, especially kind of on some of the new projects that I haven't worked on, you know, when I first came in, I didn't know what a parking study would involve. So I definitely would offer myself up to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in learning because I haven't done this before. Same thing with any other type of study. So kind of with that mindset helped me uh, set up a lot of develop a good relationship with a lot of the PMs in the office and, you know, and then got me going from there. What would you add to that, Sarah? So um, coming into the Fair and Peers, I knew the discipline groups were something that was really unique um, and wonderful about the company. So at the beginning, I listened in on a few of those calls and picked the ones that I wanted to actively participate in every month. Um, and I've made sure to sign up to help on at least one discipline group initiative each year. Um, another thing that I did was I identified senior staff members company-wide that were working in areas that I was interested in. So when I came down to California for trainings, um, I set aside time on their calendars to introduce myself over coffee. Um, and these informational conversations had led to numerous leadership opportunities for me um, over the years. Again, were there is there any hesitation for you or is it just more your personality where you're pretty comfortable saying, hey, I don't know you, but I'm Sarah and I'd like to have coffee with you? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of my personality, um, yeah. but also, is, you know, it, there's a lot of people and a lot of great resources. And I just wanted to, you know, put a face to the name and um, everyone was really friendly and willing to meet me. So um, I would encourage others to do the same. Great. Good for you. How about you, Jesse? Um, yeah, there's a few things I would add. I'd say, you know, taking advantage of opportunities as they arrive. So often during staff meetings, project managers or senior senior staffs um, would mention upcoming projects or proposals or a desire to write a drive post. So drive is our, our internal wiki at Fair and Peers um, to write a drive post about different topics such as recent grant funding or recent news articles. And so when I was interested in those topics, I would volunteer and that would give me an opportunity to get to know new project managers that I maybe hadn't worked with before and also to learn about new emerging topics. Um, in addition to volunteering for these opportunities, I'd also say that you can create your own opportunities here at Fair and Peers. So getting able, being able to kind of start and lead the equity initiative has been a great example of that. Um, just in general, as, if, as a new hire, if you're reading about something that you don't think other people are talking about yet or is an emerging topic, you know, feeling feeling comfortable to kind of initiate this new conversation about a new topic as a way to really network with people around the company that share your interests and learn from them. Um, and finally, I would just add that you can pull and share from your previous experience, either in school or from previous jobs. So just because you're a new hire, that doesn't mean that you don't have a lot to bring to the table. So being really open about, you know, what's your expertise and what have you really done a deep dive in either in your graduate studies or in previous work, because that, that can add a ton of value to the work that we're doing here that may be something, you know, Fair and Pierce hasn't done a lot of work in. Great, thanks, Jesse. So we're gonna go to the chat box now. We got a few questions here. And uh, the first question says, Alan and Jesse both mentioned research in the company. Are the researchers also employees such as planners and engineers or are the researchers separately recruited? The short answer to the question is yes, they are planners and engineers. In fact, uh, we don't really have separate research group. It's we, we we like to refer to it as a culture of innovation, which which in our world means everybody's involved to some degree in in research development and and and, and there's lots of different ways that that happens, as you've heard some examples here today. But it's one of those things where everybody's engaged in it, and it's not a separate group, or they're not separately hired. So, uh, anything anybody wants to add on to that one? Uh, this is Jesse. I would just add that our research is research that informs practice. So, while we do research, it's generally something that is related to kind of planning and implementation, um, rather than something that's more high level or academic. Yeah, I, I, thanks for making that point. It's, it's it's applied research and applied from a consulting perspective to our our clients. So that's a great point. We we leave the academic research to the academic academicians and the universities, and we, ours is more focused on on uh, applied to our clients' most pressing problems for sure. So next up uh, is what what are some options to getting entry level job experience that is needed in the first planning engineering job. So it's, this is one of those 
kind of how do I get started type questions uh, that that uh, that we hear a lot. So, um, Sarah, may, maybe you can uh, share some perspective on this one. Sure. So it's kind of like before your first job, how do you gain experience in the field? Yeah, exactly. And and I, okay. I'm going to guess online advertising probably worked for you, but may not be a common path. For yeah. So I'd say um, one of the things that was really effective for me was doing informational interviews. I'm a big fan of that. I didn't exactly know the specific niche within playing that I wanted to do. So before school, I did about 30 informational interviews with people in the city of Seattle. Um, and that really helped me hone in on exactly what I wanted to do, um, as well as, you know, joining professional organizations like APA, WTS, um, Young Professionals in Transportation. There's a lot of them out there. They host really great, you know, happy hours as well as lecture series. And so you can meet people and network through those. Um, and then I think just reading blogs online um, to stay up to speed on current trends, um, that can go a long way. Alan, anything you would add to that? No, I would just, yeah, reemphasize the importance of kind of, you know, building the connections, getting to know people in the industry. You know, it could be as simple as going to a happy hour, you know, or some sort of info session hosted by a company just to kind of know what the company is doing. And I guess one other suggestion would be to, um, you know, maybe just look through some of the reports or uh, studies that have been done by fair and peers and others uh, in the in the in the industry just kind of see what has been done there and then uh, get a better understanding of the, the the industry there yeah i think i don't know if any of you did this but I, I i often give the advice to uh to especially those who are early fairly early in their undergrad degree or they're maybe they're, they're early in their planning graduate program but again they've just more recently decided to try to pursue transportation to go to those, like you say, happy hours, Alan, or or just the events at a at a YPT, or maybe it's an APA or an ITE meeting or some one of the professional organizations, and just start networking. I know it sounds a little like you're sort of you know networking into this this abyss, but but it, it actually works, right? It 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 gets you started. It usually connections and relationships start to form over time, and opportunities will will spin out of that. Um, just applying blindly to online job ads just often doesn't get it, especially if you're if you don't have a lot on the resume to, to start with. Another thing I'd say for networking that was really successful for me was looking at alumni networks. And um, most schools have a, a list with with email addresses, and so um, you know moving across the country um, from New York for me, there were very few people that were alum in my in Seattle. And so I just contacted the few people that were here and everyone was very willing to meet with me. Um, so kind of using your alumni network, everyone's eager to help you. Good, good suggestion there. Um, so there's a question here. Uh, maybe Alan, what, what is your thought on uh, data mining? Skill and programming appreciated for work at Fair and Peers. I mean, again, the, the short answer is yes, but you, and, and everybody seemed to mention Excel, which isn't isn't exactly data mining, but it it, it, it is indicative of to, to to my sense, and I, I want to see if you agree with this, that that just as more and more data becomes available, that skill set and related types of analytical skill sets, database management, uh, coding, all those things is becoming increasingly important. Would you yes. agree with that? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. We actually, uh, not me personally, but we have like my colleague here just sitting next door is uh, David Wasserman is heavily involved in a lot of the heavy data analysis. And then that's one of the trend we're seeing here as well is, you know, as a lot of the data, data sets that we get in these days are, you know, way beyond what Excel can handle. So kind of getting that advanced programming or data analysis skill set, I think is definitely becoming a more increasing need in the in the company. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, we just, in fact, earlier this year, we hired our first database engineer uh, with somebody that's not not traditionally a planning or engineering background, but comes with a heavy database uh, management background, and that's he's been really effective for us. So I, I, I can certainly see that going forward in the future. Uh, here's a, a question about back to research. Jesse, how does research translate into your day-to-day -day job tasks? So as 
as Matt and I said previously, the research that we do is intended to inform practice. And so we have these discipline groups that focus on bike ped or transit, um, engineering operations, et cetera. Um, and so what the research that they do um, helps make sure that Fair and Peers is kind of implementing best practices and, and innovative and at the cutting edge of the work that's being done in transportation. And so in our day to day, we can refer to um, deliverables that have been created or just the, the experts within the company that have done this research to, to apply that to the work that we're doing. Um, so for example, um, Fair and Peers has developed um, several proprietary tools that can kind of ease the process for doing different types of analysis. So for example, we have a tool called Crosswalk Plus. And so this helps us identify what is the right um, approach to a pedestrian crossing. Um, will just a crosswalk do? Do we need to have um, something in addition to that to make sure that pedestrian safety is ensured? And so um, we had done research to kind of understand the efficacy of different um, crosswalk treatments and um, pedestrian safety treatments. And so now we have an Excel sheet that if you are working on a project related to pedestrian safety and are specifically interested in what crossing treatment is appropriate at the location that you're working on, um, you can input things like number of lanes or speed limit or number of vehicles um, that pass during the peak hour or during the day and then the amount of pedestrian demand and that will then the tool will tell you as a result of you know this national best practice research what will be the best um, countermeasures to implement at this location. So that's just one example, but finding ways to kind of consolidate research that's been done elsewhere or research that we've been done on our own um, to kind of streamline our day-to-day -day processes. Thanks, that's, that's good. There's, I'm just skimming through the chat here. There's some really good questions coming in. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit because I want to come back to you in a minute, Jesse, to answer the, the one from Chapel Hill, of course. We have to, since you threw in the Go Heels there, we have to do that. Um, let's, let's go, uh, Sarah, there's a question here about how do you recommend students attending TRB maximize their time and learning experience? Have you been? I know Jesse's been. Uh, have you I have been never to been to TRB. Okay. I can, and I, know, I can speak to conferences in general, but I don't know please, if someone... Please do that, and then we'll let Jesse talk a little about TRB, and then Alan as well, if you've had experience there. I think it's helpful to look at the program in advance and kind of go in with a plan for what sessions you want to attend, either to expand on topics that maybe you don't know as much about, or to maybe dive deeper into some topics that you are focusing in. Um, but I think for me, those kinds of conferences, more than anything, are about the networking. And so you know, at the lunch sessions or the coffee breaks to really go out of your comfort zone and talk to people you don't know, don't stand with the people that you've gone with and um, talk to people that are new. That's how I've gotten the most out of conferences. Alan, have you been to TRB? I have not. <laughs> we submitted a paper, but I didn't end up going for that time. Got it, yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, I, Jesse, so you, I know you're obviously there in DC and you've been several times, so. Tell us your secrets on TRB. <laughs> I don't know that I have TRB secrets, but um, for those of you who haven't been to DRB, it's massive and it can be a bit overwhelming. So I think the first thing I'd say is, you know, give yourself permission to take a break or, you know, skip some sessions. You're in DC, you can go to the Smithsonian. You can like really give yourself a little breathing room because I think it's a lot of information to take in and a lot of great resources to take advantage of, but you also don't want to be exhausted on day two and not be able to kind of carry through. Um, one of the recommendations I would say is to try to go to one of the Sunday workshops. So a lot of the sessions during the week are panel format um, and there's not a lot of opportunities for discussion, but the weekend workshops are a bit longer and they give you an opportunity to maybe meet more people and and just be more actively engaged um, in, in the content. Um, also during the week, there are committee meetings. So in addition to there being panel sessions, there are committees that include um, academics and professionals. There are some fair and peer staff on different committees as well um, and representatives from public agencies. And so these committees can be very broad as in like land use and transportation, and then they can be super, super specific. Um, and so if you have a certain interest, that's a really great way to get exposed to people who are working specifically in this area. Um, and you can get a sense of kind of what are the research priorities and things like that. Um, I'd echo what Sarah said about 
conferences in general, that they're a great opportunity to network. Um, so yeah, good luck and take advantage of the resources. Okay, Jesse, uh, here's the question from uh, Clay at, at UNC Chapel Hill. He's interested in freight planning. Saw that Baron Pierce has some considerable work in this area. How much of the staff is devoted to this area? And what generally is the expertise? So I said Chapel Hill because it was you. I don't know. I, I can answer this question if you don't feel as as uh, informed on the topic, but uh, I'll leave it to you. Uh, I'll start, and you can pick up where I leave off, no, I guess. Um, so Fair and Peers has a few freight experts, mostly based in Southern California, um, and I would say that a lot of the work that we're doing is out of those offices, and it has not yet become um, a big service for us in a lot of, in at least in DC or in the other offices, but it is something that we're looking into expanding. You can expand on that, Matt. Yeah, it's a, it's a relatively uh, recent uh, expansion, I'd say in the last five years or so for the firm, and it's rapidly growing. Um, as Jesse said, it's started in Southern California, and that's where the bulk of our work is at the moment, although we also do quite a bit of freight work up in the Pacific Northwest as well and and periodically in in other states uh around the country as well but it's in terms of the the uh it's, it's mostly planning and modeling type work in terms of the general uh expertise and in terms of how much of the staff is devoted to this area it's it's not a big percentage right now i would say it's probably in the five percent range uh would be a rough estimate but i we don't really kind of track it all hyper specifically that way but it's 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 a budding but rapidly growing part of what we do so uh, i think it's important to to make that distinction all right uh great question here uh it was great to hear sarah mention wts and also have two women presenters can you speak to the culture of empowering women in their careers at fair and peers sarah why don't we start with you and then see if jesse has anything to add that's quite a question um i'd say Looking around at the company, um, there are lots of females in leadership positions, and everyone has been very receptive to mentorship. Um, so, kind of several, everyone has an opportunity to, um, within their first uh, year, I believe, join the early career mentor, or after their first year, join the early career mentorship program. So, I specifically sought out a female mentor. Um, and so, you know, we talk about all kinds of things related to my day-to-day -day job, but um, not necessarily um, specific to that. Um, so I am drawing a little bit of a blank here, but I mean, there's tons of uh, emails I looked up to here at the company. <laughs> yeah, no, Jesse, I, I don't know if you great. want to expand on that. Yeah, I guess something I'd add also is that, um, so every few years, Fair and Peers has um, a leadership development forum, which is where we kind of pull staff from around the company to focus on an issue of importance. So um, in the past that has been talking about work-life balance or talking about you know how we create a workplace that um, where millennials thrive and it kind of fits the millennial environment. Um, and the one that we focused on for 2018 was diversity and inclusion. And so gender is one of you know the many ways in which Fair and Peers wants to be diverse and promote inclusion. But um, we talked about lots of different ways to make sure that we are hiring from a diverse pool of candidates and that while they're here, there are opportunities for mentorship similar to what Sarah mentioned. Um, and just that we're creating a culture that, you know, our social events are not always focused on um, sports or not always focused on something related to drinking. And so that we're making sure that people who have a variety of different preferences and come from a variety of different backgrounds um, feel comfortable and feel like their um, culture and personality and their like authenticity of self can come through at the company. I guess one other thing I would expand on is even though we have several formal programs for mentorship, um, there's lots of informal mentorship opportunities as well. You know, when we were traveling to different project um, meetings off-site, you know, there's sometimes two-hour-long car trips. So when I was just down in California for um, a meeting with for this Pittsburgh Active Transportation Plan that I mentioned earlier that I took over for my colleague. I had um, several hours in the car with um, one of the principals out of the Walnut Creek off office, which was a great opportunity to um, just talk with her and get her input on a variety of things um, that I'm dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis in my job. So um, that's also an opportunity that um, we find as well. Great. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that we are the proud 
recipients of uh, the WTS Employer of the Year Award in five of our office locations over the last few years. So other, other nice to have some external recognition along those lines as well. All right, uh, the next one comes from Mitch. Does uh, Farron Peers have programs to help further an employee's education, masters, lead, AICP, mentorships? We've talked a little about that. Alan, you're, you're in the, the formal one-on-one -on -one mentoring program this year. Maybe you can talk a little about that as well as, as the other uh, educational support programs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm yeah, as Matt mentioned, I'm in the one on one mentoring program this year with the uh, another uh with the associate in the Seattle office actually. So we start this it's a one year program and then we meet or we ha we have, you know, we buy bi actually bi weekly calls uh to kind of just checking on, on stuff. Uh, it's generally around one hour, but oftentimes I'll kind of send him a quick message if I run into some sort of questions and on those, I guess, more regularly scheduled calls where we talk about uh, different issues that I'm dealing with or, you know, some of the longer term career goals like, you know, where do you want to be in five years and how do you kind of get there? So not only to kind of just setting those goals, but also identifying, you know, more concrete steps to kind of achieve those goals on, the, on those calls. And then we also have, uh, I want to say, three months checking uh, that, you know, we would go up there. Uh, like, for example, I would go up there to meet him up and then we would kind of stay there for a day or two and shadow him for, for some of the work that he's doing and sit in some of the meetings just to kind of see how he handles the meetings and then he, how he kind of manages clients and all that. And same thing, he would come down and see how I kind of work here in the, in the South Bay, here in the Bay Area. So I feel like that's a great opportunity for me to kind of learn at this point of my career where I'm trying to kind of transition from more of a technical role to more project management. So that was, that's been super helpful for me over the last nine months or so. Um, in terms of some of the educational, I passed, for example, from my personal experience, I took the PE exam uh, early in 2017. And then the company was very supportive of that, uh, you know, not only sponsoring, you know, for for books and uh, and the exams themselves, but also, uh, you know, supporting me on the on the kind of like the work life balance fit side of things, just to make sure, you know, I kind of carve out enough time to study and prepare for the exam. So that was that's been super helpful as well. Anything you would add, Jesse? Um, yeah, I would add. So Fair and Pierce supported me. Do, doing um, an AICP training class or pre preparation class as well um, as the cost of taking the exam. And there are so many people in the company who have taken either the PE or the AICP. So they're just really great resources. Um, so, you know, I'm sure as you've studied for different exams in undergrad or in graduate school, you've, you know, developed a lot of useful materials. And so I found that at Fair and Peers, there's a lot of support um, in preparing for these exams as well. Great, and I would just uh, also add, um, in addition to, to what you just mentioned, the, the tuition reimbursement uh, program that we have for those getting degrees in, in things. Um, and then back to the mentoring and, and training programs, we have extensive in-house uh, training. Sometimes that's in-person, sometimes that's uh, web-based training. And, uh, and then the mentoring program has six different facets to it. You've heard some elements of it. Uh, but just to kind of give you a, a flavor, so it starts kind of at the new hire level. There's usually a new hire, uh, somebody right when you start. There's typically a buddy uh, that's assigned in your office in the first year. After the first year, Sarah mentioned the early career mentoring, which when you're mentored by somebody that is has maybe four or five years of experience, typically in, in about year two or three for you. Uh, and then, and then a little later, then you get into the one-on-one -on -one mentoring options, like Alan just talked about. He's involved in that program this year. Uh, beyond that, we also have group coaching that takes place, and oftentimes that's for for more senior uh, managers that that uh, for for different typically for common types of job functions, but it uh, will span different uh, parts of the company, different regions of the company, individuals that are located in different offices. And then finally, we also have in-house executive coaching. We have a subsidiary called Left Lane Advisors that does uh, that not only does some management consulting work to other agencies and A&E industry type uh, firms, but but also it has uh, Katie Miller, one of our partners, is is the is a certified 
uh, executive coach and not only provides that externally, but certainly provides that within Fair and Peers as well. So it's a pretty comprehensive, robust set of, uh, of mentoring and training options that are out there. So uh, moving on then to the next question, does Fair and Peers have future expansion plans and what kind of opportunities might that present for new hires? Okay, I'm gonna take this one because for those of you on the call, I'm gonna fill you in on something we haven't even announced publicly yet. So in our, our most recent geographic expansion, we had 20, in 2015, we opened in DC and Jesse moved there, uh, as she mentioned earlier. Uh, then in 2017, we opened uh, an office in Portland and next year we'll be opening an office in Orlando, Florida. So the, the formal announcement will probably go out on that either later this week or early next week. I, I don't know uh, exactly the timing on that, but pretty close in the next week or so. So that's exciting. And, and yes, we do move a lot of people around uh, as part of that process. So it not only creates opportunities for new hires, but it creates opportunities for people within the company. In fact, we like to move people because it transfers the culture of the firm. And, and that, that relates to one of the other questions that we had actually ahead of time came in about the possibility of relocating to a different office. Uh, maybe, uh, Jesse, you could talk a little bit about, and Sarah both could talk a little bit about, uh, sorry, Alan, uh, a little bit about, uh, you know, what, what happened what, when you came about that you decided, hey, I might want to consider moving. What did that entail and how did that happen logistically? Sure, I could start. Um, so I had always lived on the East Coast, and then I got a job at Fair and Piers in San Francisco and was excited to move. But kind of after I settled in in San Francisco, I realized that, you know, it wasn't going to be the right long term fit for me. And so while I had a desire to move back to the East Coast, I wasn't necessarily in a rush. And so I at my reviews at, you know, three, six months, um, I let my superiors know that, you know, I'm really enjoying working here, but I think long term, I'll I'll probably want to be based back on the East Coast. And so, the DC office was only about three people when I first started at Fair and Piers, and so there wasn't really the the need um, to move me there at that time. There wasn't really sufficient work in the DC office to support another staff member. And so, um, about 18 months after I'd been working at Fair and Piers, there was an opportunity for me to move to DC. And so even after I moved, um, I was partially working on DC projects, but also working on projects I was still part of in San Francisco. I mean, even today, there are some projects I'm working on in San Francisco that are a carryover from when I worked there a few years ago. Um, so I just say that if it's something that you are interested in, you know, be upfront and honest um, with your managers because, you know, things often don't happen if you don't ask for them, um, but be flexible. Um, and yeah, I think those would be my two pieces of advice. Thanks. How about you, Alan? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned kind of briefly earlier, I started in the Roosevelt office and spent about two years there. And uh, actually at the time when I was in Roosevelt, I had to kind of come back to the Bay Area quite often just because a lot of my friends from uh, Cal were kind of still in the Bay Area. So that was when I made a lot of travel on the weekends and then uh, would kind of just come back and visit them. So I've been kind of, so moving back to the Bay Area has always kind of been in the back of my head, similar to kind of what Jesse was mentioning earlier. Uh, so I kind of made that very clear. And then uh, like Jesse mentioned, honest to my office manager, let them know that, you know, I would like to move back to the Bay Area eventually. And especially after my, my wife got the job here uh, in 2015, that's when we decided, you know, the, the move. So a few months before that, we had started the conversation with the, the office manager. And then there was just a lot of kind of discussions on, you know, we, of all the Bay Area offices, since we do have four offices here in the Bay Area, what would make the most sense for me, uh, given my, I guess, my personality, my skill set, and al also what the office needs. So after kind of wor working through that with the office manager and also talking with a few other office managers of the different uh, of the different Bayer offices, we decided that San Jose would be a good fit for me, just given that there was, a, a, I guess, a need, a stronger need for kind of like the technical skills that I possess at the time. So that's when we made the decision and then transitioned down here uh, to the San Jose office. And just, uh, I guess the transition probably happened a little sooner than I originally expected. Cause you know, before I moved, I think the plan was still for me to kind of work on maybe split my time between 
San Jose and Roseville projects maybe 50-50 for at least six months or so. But uh, my demand got high pretty quickly here in the San Jose, just given that there's a lot of kind of technical modeling work going on here in the office. So I was kind of just plugging into those projects very quickly and took on some new, very interesting projects and opportunities, right? You know, maybe two or three months after I moved down here. So that transition happened very smoothly. But I agree with Jesse, what Jesse said, just kind of be flexible and knowing what the the demand is uh, in the office from both sides. I think that that would be my advice there. Thanks, Alan. Yeah, I'm just, uh, Tino O'Hara, our HR director, and I are sitting here talking a little bit about what percentage of the total staff is Farron Pierce have worked and, and have relocated while working at the company. And I, I'm, I'm speculating, we don't have a hard number, but I'm speculating it's at least 20%. I bet you it's even higher than that. So I've, I've also relocated myself. So it was a while back, but uh, anyway, it's common here and encouraged. Um, where it makes most the most sense for people personally and professionally. So um, here's the next question. Uh, this year, Fair and Peers had an interview at TRB. Will Fair and Peers be doing the same again this year? And could you share some suggestions on it? So the short answer to the first question is yes. We will be doing a uh, very similar type uh, process this year that we did last year. And uh, in terms of suggestions, Jesse, you're you're our TRB expert here on the panel. What what did we interview you at TRB initially? You did. I was Excellent. I was sick. And you're, you're and highly I, qualified. Yeah, I was sick and you, I thought I totally sick? bombed it and I cried afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but it all turned out okay, hey, clearly. <laughs> we call this unfiltered career insight. Unfiltered career advice. And one of our um, panelists just admitted that she was sick and she cried. Okay, so that's <laughs> That's as unfiltered as you're going to get right there. Um, yeah, but I think just general interview advice that I would provide um, is just to be really specific about your experience. So, um, you know, it's great to know at a high level that you worked at a certain um, agency or firm, but or on a specific project. But if you could really dive into the details when you're being interviewed, that really helps us get a sense of if you're a good fit for Fair and Peers. So. For example, if you worked on a project related to transit, you know, what exactly did you do? Were you looking at ridership data? What were the tools that you used? Was it Excel or GIS? And um, to the extent that you can be really explicit about like what you know and how you applied what you knew to the project that you worked on, that can really go a long way um, beyond just kind of a more general description of your experience. Sarah, what do you think? Other, other interview advice for the group? I think um, what Jesse kind of hit on earlier in the Q&A about, you know, one of the key skills in our role is critical thinking. And so some of that you can't really prepare for. It's just, you know, during the interview process, we want to get a sense for how you process um, different problems and the thought process you go through. So, I mean, there's some preparation you can do for that, but some of that's just like us learning your thought process. Um, I think another just general piece of advice is just be enthusiastic, assuming you're passionate about transportation, which is I assume why you're, you'd be interested in applying at Fair and Peers, make sure that comes across. Because um, there have been several candidates I've seen who just don't seem like they want the job. So um, if, if you want it, make sure that comes across. Maybe they were sick and went home and cried afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, yeah, that, that is, seriously, that is great advice. You. Do your homework on the firm that you're interviewing with and come in prepared and ready to explain why you want to be here. I think that's those are all great suggestions. Okay, uh, next up, we got a few more that have come in here. We've got seven minutes, so we'll just keep plowing through. How do you see autonomous technology impacting the field of planning and how might planners prepare their skills for this future? So, Alan, you mentioned earlier doing some AV modeling work for some uh, clients in the in the Silicon Valley area. Um, on a scale of one to ten, how do you see with no no impact at all and ten being massive <laughs> impact? Uh, how do you see it? <laughs> I want to say it's definitely between seven and ten based on our I guess initial research and observation uh, on some of the I guess other people's research here is it's going to be a pretty significant impact on both you know how people how people would travel in terms of their mode choice in terms of their travel behavior 
and as well as on some of the infrastructure side of things, you know, how do you kind of allocate curbside space? How do you, you know, rebuild your infrastructure to accommodate all the AVs on the road, which are going to most likely behave differently than how human drivers are driving today? So, I would say it's going to be a pretty significant impact. And then, um, and then it's it's a pretty big question in terms of how the playing world is accommodating that. I mean, we're doing a lot of research on that front. Uh, doing a lot of different modeling projects and research projects, uh, both internally for our DG discipline groups, as well as externally, like Matt mentioned, for some clients here in the in the South Bay, uh, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, but in terms of the, yeah, yeah, I'd say it's going to be a pretty significant impact from my perspective. And Jesse, you just you just wrapped up the uh, the AVs and equity research project that we did with the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, so you've got a kind of a little bit more of a policy kind of lens on it in addition to what Alan shared on more of the analytical side. What what would you say to this? Yeah, I guess I think Alan kind of mentioned this, but you know, we're already I think AVs are already changing the way that we're doing our work and it's already something that we're considering on a lot of our projects. Um, especially because if you're thinking about building a parking structure today, you know, will that be necessary at the end of the life of that structure? So it's definitely something that's already affecting our work. Um, for the AVs and equity project, um, as Matt said, we were working with um, the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is a science-based nonprofit in the DC area. Um, and we were looking specifically at DC, how autonomous vehicles would affect social equity. So focusing on areas in the DC region that have a concentration of low-income households or households of color. Um, and so something I think that we're specifically working with cities now is how can we not just be technology takers as AVs come, but what are the policies that we need to put in place to make sure that the AV future um, is the future that we want and that we're not just exacerbating some of our existing transportation challenges, but using AVs to solve them. Great. Yeah, Sarah, do you have a, a quick thought on this one? Uh, nope, I think they, they covered it well. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say I, I think it's, uh, Alan said, 7 to 10 on that scale. I think it's it's already a 7, and it's rapidly moving to, to a 10. It's, things are, things are going to change in ways we can't even foresee right now, but th they're certainly going to change, and we're, that's why we're investing some of our, our own money to try to help clients think forward on this because, uh, because of the, the, the degree to which we feel it's going to change. So. Uh, it's exciting times, no question about it, to be in this in this field. Uh, a couple other quick questions here. We've got just a couple minutes. Uh, yes, we will have an email ad address up for you here at the end, so you can follow up. And anybody, send us your question. We didn't get time to cover questions or ones that you sent in advance that we didn't have a chance to cover. Um, send those by email, and we will be following up at TRB. Uh, one last question here about certain types of new graduates we prefer hiring, and are there certain types? And then it kind of goes along with a question we got earlier about um, somebody who doesn't have an academic background in, in planning and transportation. So uh, I want to make sure that one, because that actually comes up every time we do one of these webinars. And, and we have uh, a visual arts major on the line. Uh, and we have a civil engineering major. And Sarah, what was your undergrad degree in again? Inter International Affairs and Anthropology. Perfect. Excellent. So there, I tell you, when I started at Fair and Pierce 26 years ago, we only hired civil engineers. And it wasn't because we hated planners it was or any other majors. It was because there were no graduate planning, transportation planning programs. And so the fact that so many are out there now is really opened things up for us and able to diversify our workforce and bring better skills and services to our clients. So um, I, I, anything, uh, I guess this question is maybe a, the better, better way to frame this last question is, is how do you go about it? How did you get uh, in just a minute or two for Sarah and Jesse both, how did you get um, from that undergraduate program into transportation? Uh, was it just simply a matter of deciding that that's what you wanted to do based on your, your interview, Sarah, and then just applying to grad school, or was there more to it than that? I mean, I think I figured out that I was passionate about transportation first, so it was kind of a, an evolving process from my previous experiences and learning that, yes, like this is the issue that I'm most passionate about, and I mm -hmm. felt like I needed to have a master's degree to do what I wanted to do to gain, you know, the technical skills and learning GIS and um, 
some other softwares, um, but then also just learning the content. I think maybe some people, I mean, because I, I have colleagues here at Fair and Peers who came from undergrad, so it's not that you have to do it that way, um, but I think that helped. Um, Good. Jesse, how about you? Yeah, so I think I first came to transportation because I really like to ride my bike. And through just being interested in bicycling, I also became interested in how we design places. So I had done a lot of bike touring and was thinking about, you know, in some of these communities I was riding through, the housing isn't near the jobs and, you know, these roads are unsafe or how do people get from point A to point B? And so um, that was really my first initial thinking about transportation and urban planning. But something I wanted to, to add about how you get into the field is that um, I think volunteering and getting involved with local transportation issues can be a really great way to meet people in the industry and help define your interests. Um, nonprofit organizations are often looking for volunteers. When I was living in Boston, I, I counted bikes at intersections um, as part of a bike census in like 2011 or 2012. And that was a, an interesting way to think about, okay, so how do, how do people collect data about this and start to think more about how people were traveling. Um, and just one kind of more high level comment about if you're thinking about going into transportation, um, the way that I think about finding your dream job or the right career is that there's two questions you wanna answer. And so one is, what are you interested in? And the second one is, how do you wanna spend your day related to that interest? So for even though transportation seems kind of niche, um, there's so many different types of jobs you can have, some of which relate to work that Fair and Peers does and some that don't. So you may be interested in, you know, directly working in communities, or you may be interested in writing about local issues or lobbying. Um, you know, you may want to work in GIS and Excel and be trying to find quantitative answers. You may want to work in CAD. There's just a really wide range of jobs that relate to transportation. And so, um, you know, going into planning and engineering is one of those avenues. And within that, you know, Fair and Peers is one of those courses you can take, but there's really a lot of different ways to, to build a career around transportation. That's a great point, Jesse. You're right. There, there are a lot of avenues out there, and, and Fair and Peers is one of them, and consulting is one, but there's lots of others, as you mentioned. So I think we'll, we're going to end on that as we're at time. Uh, you see the uh, the careers at fairandpeers.com. For those of you who didn't get questions answered or think of questions afterwards, feel free to shoot us uh, an email, and we will respond as soon as we can on that. Thanks to everybody who, who joined us uh, this evening, and thanks to our three panel members. Great job, guys. We really appreciate you carving out some time, especially Jesse there on the East Coast. It's a little later even for you. So thanks again and, uh, and have a great rest of your week.